Yeah, I think what's really important about naloxone, and it's always been the case, is that anybody who is at risk for having or witnessing an opioid overdose should be trained in recognizing an overdose and how to respond to it and consider getting naloxone. A lot of the effort in the last five years has focused on police and first responders. And that's an interesting and important group. In our work in Washington State distributing naloxone though, we're finding about 1% of the naloxone we distribute to police is actually used in reversing an overdose, as opposed to more than 25% of the naloxone we distribute to people who have opioid disorder and their friends and family. So this idea about getting out naloxone to that broader group of people is really important and likely to have a bigger impact. There are multiple ways to get naloxone. So if a person is an injection drug user, almost all syringe exchanges at this point are able to distribute it for free. And I think it's very important for anybody who's a chronic pain patient taking opioids or friends and family of them to access a naloxone kit. For people who are themselves at risk for overdose, almost all insurance, including Medicaid and the state, will pay for that naloxone kit. If you know somebody is an opioid user, and they're unconscious and you can't wake them up after giving them a sternal rub, you should assume they're having an overdose. And the first thing to do is to call 911, tell them a person is not breathing, that will get the quickest response. Um, then a person would give a couple of rescue breaths, and you can see on our webpage how to do rescue breathing, just a couple of quick rescue breaths. That sometimes can be enough to sort of startle and awaken a person or actually get um, oxygen moving into the lungs and wake them up. And if not, if a person has naloxone, they should administer it immediately, um, and they should keep doing rescue breathing. So an opioid overdose is a crisis of breathing. People need oxygen. And so the oxygen can be delivered um, either by a person breathing for them, by giving naloxone, which takes two to four minutes to work, the person starts breathing on their own, and or by having fire come on scene and provide rescue breathing. Yes, the only thing naloxone does is reverse an opioid overdose. So if a person's not on opioids, it's not gonna have any impact on them. Really important, so um, opioid use disorder is a treatable medical condition. That's really important for people to understand. Um, it's a medical condition. It's not just a behavior. It's not just people acting in a crazy way. They actually have a medical condition. Their brain chemistry has changed. Um, and it's treatable. And the most evidence-based treatments out there are treatment medications that are opioid medications that instead of injecting every couple of hours, you actually take by mouth once a day. And those medications help a pe person feel normal and be able to function and reduce their overdose risk and help them uh, move into recovery. So those treatment medications are, in fact, um, really supporting recovery and their really long-term overdose prevention as well. People on those medications, their chance of dying from an opioid overdose is cut in half. So what we're working to build, and Seattle's really novel in this, is building low barrier access to these treatment medications. There are several active programs, we're helping evaluate one of them right now, where people can actually get in and get started on medications that day. Not two months later after three, three medical appointments and navigating our complicated healthcare system, because they're a person who's at high risk of dying. They need that medication right then. And so we're in the middle of building uh, many more uh, entry points for people to to be able to access those treatment medications very quickly and be able to keep getting them without a lot of requirements. Is that we've often said, well, we wanna treat the people who are most motivated. And so we're gonna treat these people who um, aren't homeless, who have health care, who don't use any other drugs. Well, that's lovely, but that's about 10 to 20% of heroin users. And you're not gonna get a lot of benefit uh, for the other 80% of people who are dealing with a lot more stuff than that. So these new treatment models we bu we're building are to deal with everybody else. The idea is that in this instance, you're treating everybody, 100% of people, and when you do that, we know these medications will cut mortality by over half. So if we're able to make medications universally available, instead of having 700 opioid deaths every year in Washington state, maybe we'd have 350 and hopefully probably even less than that. So we're trying to make sure we're providing something for everybody. We have these different care settings and we have these different medications and we're trying to allow people with opiate use disorder, which is just another medical condition, the same thing that everybody else with medical conditions gets, which is uh, good information, shared decision making, and a voice in what type of care they want to get and where they want to get it. It's a three-piece kit. 
And so you just take this in and you screw it in gently. And then you screw on the top. And then you squirt it up somebody's nose. And that's oh, it. Gotcha. Um, we actually have gotcha, other devices gotcha. as well. That's, that's works great. We thought it was going to be too high of a dose. We were a little worried about it at first, but it's fine. Um, yeah, it'd be really nice for Oaks Farm. Yeah, yeah, it. keep kind of... Uh, there you go. Um, it is... Uh, yeah, I mean, that's what I would do. And we're actually at the point, we're very close to having... Um, we can actually rotate that if you want a better okay. angle on. Um, that sheet about the app good. with... The observed dosing, the med. Mm -hmm. Yep. Which yeah. was so far...